Welcome everyone to today's lecture by Dr. Justin Su. I don't think Dr. Su need any introduction, but still I will give some to, especially to the people who may not know her that well. First, Justin Su has been a legend uh, in our community and at CISA. Since she joined CISA in 1990s, she has done so much work um, to our school, to our community. She had been the director of the China Institute for 20 years, I think from 1995 to 2015. And during her leadership, uh, under her leadership, China Institute had made a tremendous uh, development. She has, um, I think, um, at least um, worked with more than 40 Chinese universities um, to develop new MOUs and brought almost uh, us thousand visiting scholars from China to CSUN. Even herself, she mentored uh, more than 100 Chinese um, visiting scholars in her time at CSUN. And it not just that, um, she also mentored many young faculty members at CSUN as well. I remember maybe 15, 16 years ago, I first met with Dr. Justin Su, and she was uh, in um, a pretty small office at the graduate uh, student office. And she talked about the potential collaborations with the Chinese universities and how it can benefit um, both the CSUN students and CSUN faculty members and build a bridge between the US and Chinese education. Um, that really started my interest in uh, this kind of international collaborations. Um, today, um, Dr. Justin Su's lecture is really not focused on the, her work on China Institute, but rather as a researcher, as an editor, it's mostly on her educational work. Remember, she's a professor of education. She actually been a leading scholar um, international education. For more than 40 years, she has been working in this field and has written numerous papers and published um, a couple of books. And we will hopefully invite Justin Su back um, next semester or beyond, beyond to give us more talks. But right now, today, we'll listen uh, mostly um, her uh, reflection of her educational career. Without further ado, I will do the stage to you, Dr. Su. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Weiming, for such a nice introduction. And I, I think one word you said that really uh, it became uh, a, a key word in my mind uh, that I think characterized very well what I have done uh, in my uh, career uh, in comparative education, and that is I have served as a bridge yeah, for uh, US-China or CSUN-China educational exchange and collaboration for promoting uh, friendship and understanding uh, between uh, the American and Chinese peoples. And I think that's a, a very good characterization of uh, what I have accomplished. And now I want to share with you uh, here uh, my reflection on my 40 years of experiences uh, in comparative education. Let's see. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to believe that it's already 40 years since I began to work in the field of education not by my own choice in the beginning, and you will learn here. So uh, here in the beginning, in the beginning, some of the early expectations and experiences I had, had uh, really had nothing to do with education. And first of all, when I was young, I think the first time I remember when I was confronted with a, a choice or an opportunity that may affect my future career was uh, when I was uh, at age seven in second grade in the elementary school. My teachers at my school recommended two students, including me, 
uh, their so-called best students and to study in the Nanjing foreign language school to study English at that time. And the purpose of uh, that school and that program was to cultivate future uh, diplomats. So it was a very prestigious honor uh, for me at that time. So I really, I wanted to go. But my mother was very firm, not letting me go because he, uh, she uh, did not want me to go into a study of English and become a diplomat. So my parents told me that their expectations for me, for my future career, is to become a scientist. Because scientists, I think, as all of you know, enjoy uh, the highest status and reputation in China at that time, Yeah, when I grew up. So uh, I, I was a very good child and a good student. So I said, OK, you know, I'm going to try to live up to my parents' expectation and will become a scientist in the future. And then, of course, uh, when I was in fourth grade in elementary school, the Cultural Revolution began. So that was a, a turbulent uh, experience for all of us who were involved. And I remember our school closed for a whole year and we just stayed at home. But then something unusual happened because uh, my father's university, all the faculty, I think the universities closed for much longer time, closed for 10 years. So this university faculty had nothing to do. And then they decided to create a middle school for the, the children of the university faculty and staff. So my middle school years, even though it was two years, were all taught by a first rate university faculty. So I really benefited from that. Uh, then when I went to high school, I was also lucky uh, because Deng Xiaoping came into power and then he uh, placed an emphasis on education. So I, I also had, I thought, a very good high school education, even though it was just two years. And uh, I did well in all fields, but I won the uh, first place in uh, the high school math competition and science competition, yeah, both physics and chemistry. So I, I thought for sure I was going to attend the best science and technology university in the country and become a scientist fulfilling my parents' uh, expectation. But then when I graduated from high school and then we had the order uh, from the leadership at that time that all of the graduates from my high school uh, uh, need to be re-educated by the peasants on the rice farm. So we all went to work on the rice farm uh, in the suburb of Nanjing. Uh, luckily, it was not a remote area as some of the uh, young people were sent to. So I worked on the rice farm for two years uh, in um, near Nanjing. And uh, I, I, I want to say that was turned out to be one of the best, most uh, uh, beneficial character development period in my life. And that really laid a solid foundation for my uh, later work and study. So I actually appreciated that experience. And, and for, for a while, I, I was planning to stay on the farm for the rest of my life <laughs> and then just to work as a farmer. Uh, I really, I love the peasants there. But then after two years of working there, I was recommended unanimously, unanimously by the farmers there to attend college as a so-called right, worker peasant soldier, college student. So at that time, I also, I said, well, that was an opportunity to attend Science and Technology University as Zhongguo Kejida was also recruiting there. And they were very interested in me because of my high school background and uh, competition awards. But then uh, that year, uh, then uh, China decided to uh, start to uh, implement the open door policy. So they said they now they need to train more people in foreign languages. And so foreign language university, international studies university had the priority to uh, select students first. So then I was assigned then to major in English at Shanghai International Studies University, which is of course a wonderful university to study. But again, it was not my choice at that time. 
So uh, I was also very fortunate that the year that I, I was going to graduate from Shanghai International Studies University, uh, China uh, started the first national exam for study abroad. That was in 1978, but only for students who study foreign language, not for science and technology yet that year. So I took that exam and I was one of the uh, 40 plus students in the nation selected to be sent to study abroad. At that time, there was no formal relationship with the United States yet. So I was sent with a group of other students and to study at University of Toronto for three years as a so-called special student in language, literature and literature uh, and culture at the University of Toronto. We were not allowed to receive or to apply to get a degree from uh, the university because we, they didn't want us to get a degree from a, a capitalist country at that time. And so at that time, the expectation for, for us, for that group of students studying abroad was to then when we return to China, we would become university teachers, a faculty to prepare the next generation of diplomats and personnel uh, to work in international relations. How, uh, <clears throat> sorry, yeah. Uh, however, upon returning from Canada, uh, I was assigned to work in the National Ministry of Education because I was one of the best students among the, uh, the students studied abroad. So they wanted to keep me to work in the National Ministry of Education. I resisted that. I said I did not want to become a bureaucrat at a very young age. I wanted to go to work for my university in Shanghai. But again, uh, in the end, we all had to obey the assignment. So I was, I was assigned to become an educator. So again, at that time, it was not my choice. But then it turned out to be a really interesting area of work. So in my role there, I coordinated the Sino-American Educational Exchange and Collaboration programs. Uh, and I prepared selected students and scholars for studying abroad. Uh, I managed scholarship programs. In fact, I was, I think, the first coordinator for the, for the Fulbright program for China. So I was responsible for selecting candidates. Um, and managing the program uh, with the American Fulbright Committee and Lee Foundation program, many other scholarship programs. I also served as a member of the Chinese education delegations abroad uh, to visit other countries, US, Germany, and Japan, for example, to learn about their educational experiences. And I worked as an interpreter for high level education meetings and uh, including the premiers and the president and all the ministers of education, and as a simultaneous interpreter for UNESCO conferences. So I worked, for example, for the UNESCO Cultural Policy Conference in Mexico. Uh, I also did some writing and translation of American educational books and articles published in China. For example, this book published by Tsinghua University, American Graduate on American Graduate Education. Among my work, and I, 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 I was a member of China's first teacher education delegation to the United States. And that delegation was headed by President Shi Ping of East China Normal University. This is Shi Ping. Shi Ping is Shi Yigong the Ye Ye. But I'm not that old. I'm not as old as Shi Ping. That's me at that time. So this woman is very special. She was our host in the United States. She's the Bai Li Jian or Jian Barris is the vice president for the American National Committee on US-China relations. And she's still there, but at that time she was very young and I was very young. And that was with the Chinese education, teacher education delegation uh, in the United States. And we visited, of course, the best teacher education uh, colleges and Stanford and, and Columbia and Harvard and, and UCLA uh, in the United States. I also in my work there received many high level education delegations from abroad, including uh, this, the American Education Foundation delegation 
led by John Goodlatte, uh, who uh, then uh, was to become my future mentor. So this is John Goodlatte, and this is the delegation visit in China. And I took them to, we visited uh, 10 cities in 20 days and visited many universities and, and schools and including uh, Yunnan, uh, of course, Bei Shida, Hua Shida, all the best uh, teacher education universities in China. Um, and I, I want to uh, I'll tell you more about uh, John Goodlad and, and then who has been my colleague, my mentor uh, and a lifetime friend. So John Goodlad, and he is one of the most prominent educational researchers and reformers in the United States. And he was the former dean for the Graduate School of Education at UCLA. Uh, there he created the very famous experimental school led the most comprehensive American national study of schooling and made UCLA Graduate School of Education number one in the United States when he was there with first class research and innovative educational experiments. So his ideas and mentoring have had the most profound impact on my career, not a job. He always tell me to pursue your career, but not focus on the job as an educator and researcher. So uh, in 1984, he moved from UCLA to University of Washington to set up the National Center for Educational Renew in order to investigate uh, the American teacher education and to establish school university partnerships across the nation. So my fascination with the Goodlatte's educational ideas and optimism for reform, he was always positive, always enthusiastic about reform, led me to graduate studies with him in the United States in 1984. And willingly, I gave up my admission to Stanford and Columbia University because I really wanted to work with him. So at University of Washington from 1984 to 1989, I participated in the most comprehensive American national study of the education of educators and in short SEE, uh, directed by Goodlad. And I worked as a member of the research team for the project, for the national project, which surveyed more than 6,000 faculty and students in 29 universities across the United States. And I went to 11 of them as a member of the research team. This is my research team and interviewed over 100 education faculty and students. These are my fellow classmates there. Uh, I want you to know a couple of famous people. Don Ernst at that time, he was the education assistant for Bill Clinton, who was the governor in Arkansas at that time, but had such great respect for my mentor and sent his education assistant to study with him. And this man, uh, Neil Fearborn, later became the president of Temple University. So we had some great times together. My doctoral dissertation was a part of the national study and uh, was uh, presented at the American Educational Research Association Conference. And uh, my dissertation was really uh, uh, thick and over 400 pages. So I was going to turn it into a book and uh, it got accepted by the State University of New York uh, University Press and to publish it. But my uh, good light told me that uh, the uh, major American university do not consider books in education yeah, as a scholarship. It has to be refereed uh, education journals, publishing top education journals. So I did that instead of writing, turn it into a book, I wrote and published five research papers in top education journals and including Oxford Review of Education and UNESCO's International Review of Education. The final report of this project is called Teachers for Our Nation Schools uh, that won national awards and have guided teacher education reform in the United States. I just translated the book into Chinese and it's uh, going to be published by East China Normal University because so far it is still the most comprehensive research report on American teacher education. Also, even when I was a graduate student, I began to uh, write and publish on comparative education 
uh, I wrote a paper, uh, People's Education in the People's Republic of China, and published that in the most widely read American education journal, Phi Delta Kappen. I think that was probably the first very early introduction of education in China to the American readers and American educators. I also presented on uh, an organizational analysis of uh, Chinese education administration at uh, uh, Harvard uh, and stated the University of New York uh, at Buffalo education forums and published the paper as a chapter in the major book on Chinese education in the United States. And those were the early introduction of Chinese education to the American people. Uh, I also published several papers in Chinese on American teacher education reform and school university partnerships in Chinese education journals in China. The best times of my graduate studies and I spent all the holiday times with my mentor and his wife in their home on the beautiful Lopez Island. And this is the big salmon that I caught on their boat. Um, and uh, we, uh, during my graduate studies, we also, uh, together with my mentor, we received uh, uh, many Chinese uh, scholars and uh, Ministry of Education officials. And this is the, uh, the director of uh, uh, international cooperation at the Ministry of Education, Li Tao. And this is the couple, is the Jiao Yi Chan Zhan Education Counselor from San Francisco. Dr. Zhou Nan Zhao is considered as the premium uh, the most prominent comparative education scholar uh, in China. Uh, he was also doing a doctoral studies in the United States. And then the, uh, so John Goodlatte enjoyed great reputation among Chinese scholars. And a few years back, and this is the uh, East China Normal University former vice president, and he's now the director of teacher education in the National Ministry of Education and visited Goodlad in his house and to exchange ideas. And so I asked him to, to write a Chinese preface for the book that I translated, Teachers for Our Nation Schools. Uh, I hope that will be uh, come out very soon. And I want to also here introduce you to the most famous book by John Goodlad uh, that has a significant impact on Chinese education. Uh, first published in 1984, this book is the uh, uh, a revolutionary account of the largest study. Even today, it's still the most comprehensive study of American schools and with observation uh, in more than 1000 classrooms and survey of thousands of teachers and students and, and parents. So this book won many national awards and he uh, went to, uh, 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 it had a very significant impact on the American educational policy making and school reform. So his optimism and agenda for improvement uh, have only grown in importance since the book's publication. And so today this book is still considered as one of the most important school reform agenda research report. And so here you see the picture even, uh, I use this as a major textbook for my teaching, uh, pre preparation of future teachers. And my daughter here, even as a baby, a few months old, start to read the book, right? And so I first translated the book in 2004, because in, uh, two, uh, in the new, at the beginning of the new century, the Chinese National Ministry of Education authorized the East China Normal University Press to publish the translation series in uh, on influential education classics from abroad. And these are some of the books, including uh, A Place Called School. And so this is the, when it first came out, the book. Uh, and then uh, in 2014, uh, the East China Normal University republished and I re-edited the book um, for publication because it's considered as Li Cheng Bei Zhu Zhu, a monumental a classic for education reform. And that year I went to visit him and that was the last time in Seattle I met him and he passed away later that year, that year during Thanksgiving time. But in this new edition, we included this photo also included 
a paper that I wrote on John Goodlatte and John Dewey, implications of their ideas for education and democracy in China. So uh, the, uh, many Chinese universities and public libraries carry copies of the book and other books by Goodlatte. And his books have become required readings in major educational uh, uh, programs in Chinese universities and a key reference by education reformers in China. Uh, Taiwan educators also translated and published the book in classic Chinese. And this Li Zhaoyang I cited here from Beijing Normal University actually did his uh, doctoral dissertation on John Goodlatte's uh, ideas. And then so many of his books, uh, at least seven have been translated into Chinese and both uh, in mainland China and in Taiwan. Um, and then this is a landmark study then uh, led by Gu Mingyuan is the, uh, uh, the, the most prominent comparative education scholar in China now uh, based in Beijing Normal University. They replicated, they used the, the methods in a place called school and they did a similar study for Chinese schools called the Zhongguo Xiaoxiao Yanjiu or study of Chinese schooling. Uh, or they also observed many classrooms and surveyed um, hundreds of students and teachers and, and parents all over China. And to uh, presented a picture of Chinese schooling in ways that Western scholars would understand. So the book, they published the book both in Chinese and English and one 2020 National Awards for Social Sciences. So you can see the English name is called Portraits of Chinese Schools and or Zhongguo Xiaoxiao Yanjiu. So this is very much modeled after a place called school. They ask the fundamental questions about why we need to have school, what are the purposes and, and what's the future of the, the school. And then a, a one a first class award for Chinese social science research. And uh, my early career research, and I, I want to say that focused really actually more on American teacher education uh, rather than comparative education. And let's see the north north or the north south. Uh -huh. Okay, one moment. <laughs> trying to, okay. Um, and then, okay. So all with presentations in national conferences and publication in top education journals, uh, including the American National Association of Teacher Educators, Teacher Education Yearbooks. Uh, here, what I want to share with especially our young faculty is that uh, very few American universities would hire Chinese American faculty for work related to China. So for example, uh, I, I was hired here purely for American education, not for comparative education or Chinese education. So you need to, first of all, to focus on doing what you are required to do well. And that for me, that was American teacher education. So after I published all this and sufficiently established myself, as a tenured professor in American higher education, then I have the freedom to create, um, uh, to develop comparative education. I have a good foundation and then I gained the freedom. Uh, so those early studies I did, including when I first came to CSUN in 1990, I, I did survey study of teacher candidates that I taught myself um, and with uh, major publications in education journals. And then when I went to work at UCLA in 1993, I did a survey study of uh, minority teacher candidates at UCLA. In fact, my study of the minority teacher candidates was considered as a pioneering research in teacher education. Nobody really focused on minority teacher candidates before. I also had major publications and, and that was included in the National Teacher Education Yearbook. I'd also, I created a case study of the UCLA school university partnerships that with major publications and also that were included in the National Teacher Education Yearbook. Um, I also designed and directed my doctoral students at UCLA to conduct a case study of the uh, Asian American students in professional schools 
including teacher education, law school, and medical school. And I also uh, came up with major publications, both in the journal and in a book. I'm going to, I will skip over these research projects as well as my leadership work and numerous programs at the China Institute to focus now our introduction to selected comparative education studies in uh, today's presentation. The first major comparative uh, education project I did was a replication of the American National Study of the Education of Educators in China with support from UCLA and the UC Pacific Rim Research Program. And that was um, in the early 1990s. And after I received early tenure and promotion at CSUN in 1993, I was offered a tenure track position at UCLA Graduate School of Education. And I worked there as a faculty in teaching and teacher education, American teaching and teacher education uh, for three years there. And then with funding support from the UC system, I began to replicate the American national study in China and designed a comparative study of teacher education in collaboration with a team of scholars, primarily at Nanjing Normal University and Nanjing Xiaozhuang College, because my parents are in Nanjing, were in Nanjing. And so when my daughter was very young, so when I went to China for field work, I can, my parents could help me to take care of my daughter. And uh, the, there are several major purposes for the study uh, and including comparative study of the teacher education policy, we looked at the, the status of the teaching profession and teacher education, and we examined the faculty attitudes and conditions, working conditions, student attitudes and experiences, curriculum and instruction, reform directions, and what's the vision and reform. So we also, we did over 2000 surveys of uh, in 23 teacher training institutions in six administrative regions in China. So I think that was the first sort of comprehensive teacher education study in China. They never before uh, did they um, uh, have such a, a large teacher education study. And I, we also included Tibet and Yunnan in our sample. Over 100 faculty and 100 education students were interviewed on location. And my doctoral student at UCLA at that time uh, also replicated the study in Taiwan for uh, her doctoral dissertation research. Research team, we wrote the comparative study reports and made multiple presentations at international conferences and published the results, both in Chinese and international journals, including UNESCO's International Review of Education and uh, uh, Journal of Education for Teaching, uh, and also etc. And uh, these are some of the photos, and, and that was me. And when I was at UCLA and doing the study there and with uh, all the scholars from all over China, um, and also this, this is my doctoral student from Taiwan. Um, and then uh, we also had uh, one of my former colleagues and who is the director of the Chinese uh, uh, edu uh, educational policy study uh, division uh, in the national ministry also came. And, and this is uh, the Nanshida, the provost uh, accompanied me to University of Tibet for the research. And we had a, a comparative education forum in Nanjing. So I went to University of Tibet uh, in person myself. And these are some of the photos there. I interviewed the teachers there. I actually, then I also, I published a paper on how to, the process of becoming teachers in Tibet. And then, the second major project, comparative education in comparative education, is the uh, actually the extension of the comparative study of teacher education to uh, a comparative study of school principals. So, in 1996, I was recruited back to CSUN as the director of the China Institute, and also the university gave me an early promotion to full professor, even though I was not here <laughs> for three years. Although my early tenure review at UCLA also received what they called unprecedented unanimous vote and approval at the Graduate School of Education. I was the first, I think, Chinese American education faculty to uh, achieve this uh, at UCLA. 
but I considered at that time the China Institute as a great platform for developing China projects and the valley as a better place, more affordable place yeah, to live. So among the early programs I designed after I came back to CSUN, uh, also as a co-director of the uh, uh, College of Education Center for Partnership for Educational Reform, or the professional development training programs for Chinese school principals, which continued over the years to fall 2019. Uh, even for the spring 2020, we planned three workshops for three Chinese education delegations. And, but of course that had to be canceled due to uh, the pandemic. And so I designed and worked together with my education faculty on the principal training program and that we started that in the late 1990s until just before the pandemic. We are uh, the, uh, the uh, participating and organizing institutions for this program include Guangzhou Normal University then merged with Guangzhou University, Nanjing Normal University, Shanghai Normal University, China Education Association for International Exchange, Beijing Education Bureau, Hubei Provincial Education Bureau and Jiangsu Provincial Education Bureau. And so the, these principals, they came, they attend both workshops on campus and we arrange for them to visit local schools and to have interaction with uh, school administrators and teachers. And this is a delegation uh, sent by the China Education Association for International Exchange. This is a delegation from Guangzhou visiting our local schools. And then for Shanghai principals, we did a shadowing project. So this Shanghai principals actually came and we arranged for them to follow American school administrators. And, and so they both, they audit our education classes, attend workshops, but they spend a lot of time shadowing and visiting classrooms and in our, our local schools. And my favorite training center in our local school is the Wong Next Century Learning Center. I also consider this as the best uh, the, the, uh, the school that has the best uh, reform practices in the United States. Uh, almost arranged for the Chinese president to visit that school uh, when uh, we were, uh, 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 and, and when, uh, when he planned the visit. So uh, for the Center for Partnership for Educational Reform, and since I came back from UCLA, uh, we developed the five purposes uh, for training, not only Chinese, but also American administrators in the center. And then to really, we want to bring them up to uh, the, uh, the current theories and practices in educational leadership. And uh, so, and then naturally uh, when we had the training program, I thought this was a, a wonderful opportunity to design a principal uh, study, comparative study. And our initial study included more than over 100 Chinese principals and who uh, came to participate in the training program and more than 100 American school principals in the Los Angeles area who are involved or participating in our, also our training um, and, deep, and, and, and credential study program. So, and this is also an exploratory study. And so we use the survey and the interview um, and uh, again, adapted from this American National Study of the Education of Educators that I participated before. We also use the data from the forums on current issues in Chinese and American education. Uh, we held these forums in Guangzhou, Shanghai, Nanjing uh, by returned Chinese school principals. So uh, the study focused on several uh, aspects and uh, we were comparing the principles profiles and preparation characteristics and values, views and visions on school reform and, uh, uh, and principles roles in reform. <clears throat> and the findings from the comparative study of school principles have been presented at international conferences and published in top education journals and in the United States and China, including Journal of School Leadership, Education and Urban Society, International Journal of Education Reform, International Education Journal, and several journals in Chinese. Now, the important thing is that this study uh, has been, is highly replicable. So it has been 
I often receive emails and letters and from scholars from different parts of the world and said they want to replicate the study. And in fact, the study has been successfully replicated by uh, educators and researchers in, in Australia, Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, South Korea, Norway, Sweden, uh, with uh, really great success accomplishments. And then uh, I want you to know that in the past few years, we have also extended uh, this the principal study to a comparison of the urban and rural school principles in China, because all the previous studies of principles and focused only on urban school principles, because the ones who came to participate in our training programs, they are mostly from urban areas in China. Uh, in the past few years, we uh, uh, yeah, it revised at collaborate with Shanghai Normal University scholars to revise and update the principal survey instruments and extended the study to the rural and minority school principals in China. So in this new study, we have gathered data from nearly 400 Chinese urban and rural school principals, including 170 urban principals in Shanghai and Jiangsu, and uh, almost 200 rural school principals uh, in Yunnan, Henan, Tibet, and Xinjiang. So uh, these are some of the major questions we ask uh, uh, the school principals in this uh, comparative study of urban and rural school uh, principles and focus or again on their uh, characteristics and, and preparation, both pre-service and in-service and their views, their values, their beliefs, and, and then uh, their visions for school reform. <clears throat> The study has present, we presented papers at the uh, both comparative and international ed education conference and world congress on comparative education and published three major reports already uh, consecutively uh, in 2019, 2020, and then one in this year. And then this is the, the link to the paper published in the uh, world congress, uh, world council for comparative education societies, the, a uh, uh, major journal on uh, global comparative education. A related project to the principal training uh, is this wonderful uh, arrangement and, and I made for uh, almost 120 administrators and teachers from the Vaughan Next Century Learning Center, our local charter school, to visit and teach in schools in Beijing and Shanghai in 2012. So together, again, I saw a great opportunity for comparative study. I did a survey with these teachers and at the end of their visit and I published the two reports on how uh, Chinese education in American eyes, right? How American teachers view Chinese education in the journal uh, of uh, world education. That was, I think the largest American education delegation to China uh, and, and here, another interesting study I want to share with you is the comparative study of science education in American and Chinese high schools. This is, uh, was also one of the earlier study I did. When I first came to CSUN at that time, with the support from the World Bank loan program, the Chinese National Ministry of Education granted CSUN $1 million for the science education teacher educator training program. So at that time, it was led by uh, the China Institute formal director, Dr. Cho uh, and T.P. Lin in the early 1990s. So 41 Chinese teacher educators in science education came to CSUN to study for one year as visiting scholars in three separate groups. We arranged a very rich study program for them, both uh, auditing science teaching methods courses at CSUN and observation of more than 150 science education classes in eight high schools. They met with over 80 science teachers and observed over 2000 American students. So again, um, so I was invited to teach a comparative education seminar to these Chinese uh, science educators. And, and so I designed a survey interview study for them at the end of the program to compare science education in the United States and China including goals and emphasis, curriculum designs, teaching and learning. And the findings were presented at comparative and international education conferences and published in uh, top education journals, UNESCO's International Review of Education and Comparative Education, 
and major journal in China. And we made recommendations uh, in these reports that have had a very significant impact on science education reform in particular, but education reform in general, more so in China than in the United States. Um, I think the return scholars and really implemented uh, the recommendations we made. I always try to make recommendations for both sides, for Chinese education and for American education. So one of the major findings, for example, with what we found at the differences in education goals and curriculum design is this learning gap. So both China and the United States, for example, try to provide high quality science education to all students. And the American politicians always, argue, always uh, advocate that they want the American students to become number one in science and math achievement. Uh, they want to prepare them well for both higher learning and for job market, but have not both China and the United States have not been able to achieve these ideal goals in their practice. In reality, the American science education focuses more on students' interests, individuality, and potentials. But the Chinese science education's emphasis in reality became preparation for tests, primarily the Gaokao entrance exam. And in curriculum design, the Chinese science education is narrower in scope, but more in-depth in knowledge than American science education. But the American science education is more interdisciplinary and covers more science topics and relates to social issues. Uh, in, in comparison, the average Chinese student spent twice as much time studying biology and chemistry and more than three times as much time studying physics as their American counterparts. Therefore, the learning gap, right? So I also had very interesting comparison of the teaching and learning methods. So here, as you can see the comparison, some of them are opposite to each other. United States teaching in isolation, China team teaching, United States very student-centered, China is teacher-centered textbook dependent in China, here very flexible. Sometimes teachers do not use much of the so-called established textbook at all. And so more focus on practice here. In China, it's more focused on theory. This is my Chinese visiting scholars word said, uh, the the American teachers rely on inductive methods. Chinese teachers rely on deductive methods, focus more on the content. American teachers focus more on the process. Doesn't matter if they don't finish a content. They have strong emphasis on the classes being teaching lively and interesting. Chinese, very detailed, very correct, cover everything. Emphasis on conformity and the emphasis in America is on creativity. Again, this is the most important. In the American classroom, teaching driven by student interest, that's very important. In China, driven by tests, standards and tests, kaoshi. Then learning, interesting differences in, in learning. Of course, 老师怎么教,学生就怎么学. So learning is very much determined by teaching. So, so in China, it's a passive style. America, very active. Teacher dependent Chinese students, American students are, have been taught they need to become independent, rely on themselves. Very diversified. Uh, in China, students are very homogeneous, very obedient, conformity. <laughs> American students, more rebellious. Learning by imagination, American student. Chinese learning by rote. But peer tutoring, really working there yeah, in the United States is the emphasis on individual work. Again, here, American learning, much driven by curiosity, Chinese, much, very much driven by standards. So these are the key differences. And then after that, another interesting study I did is a comparative study of elementary school education. I know some of our young faculty here have young children in elementary school, and I mentioned before some of my findings here. Uh, I became interested in this when my daughter attended our local elementary school here. And then one of the best uh, schools she attended in Los Angeles 
but I observed the critical differences in the curriculum design and organization of teaching, which significantly affected the learning experience and outcomes for kids. By the time students finish fourth grade, Chinese students are two levels higher. Actually, recent study found it's two and a half or even three levels higher in basic skills than the American students as proven by also other comparative studies. This book, for example, Learning Gap and the Teaching Gap and my research, okay? Um, and then the, I designed, so I conducted a com comparative study to examine and compare the nature, structure, and approaches in teaching in American and Chinese elementary schools in order to explain differences and make recommendations for change in both, on both sides. I decided to do a visual ethnographic case study in two American fifth grade classrooms in one of the best elementary schools here, actually my daughter's elementary school at that time, and two Chinese fifth grade classrooms in one of the best elementary schools in Nanjing in collaboration with my former scholars from Nanjing Normal University. We replicate the methods from a comparative study of preschool in three cultures, China, Japan, and the United States. Excellent, excellent study there. There is a video a documentary uh, on that study that I ordered for our uh, CSUN library has a copy. So we use the classroom observation and videotaping and it's called video, visual ethnography in each of the Chinese and American fifth grade classrooms. We, I, we did in-depth in interview of the teachers. We surveyed the students, examination of curriculum and instruction, reflective discussions with teachers in China and the US while showing them videos of teaching from the other side. And we make presentations and publications in top journals in both nations and with recommendations for reform. Uh, one of my major findings is that it's the team teaching methods in China versus teaching in isolation. This is especially prominent in elementary schools, more so than in high schools. Very much uh, it's a depending on the values and value difference in two countries and collectivism in China versus the emphasis on individualism here. So while the Chinese teachers, they plan lessons together, they work together in teaching in a team approach, American elementary school teachers work in isolation all day long. In this is the American sociologist, the word called accurate classrooms isolated from each other with no time to interact with and observe other teachers. This is especially so in elementary schools. My research report just entitled The Isolated Teacher went on the cover page of Johnson Foundation's Educational Policy Journal and generated strong reactions from American principals and superintendents. A second major finding I have from the elementary school study is the single versus multiple subject approach. So in addition to teaching in isolation, the key weakness in American elementary education is the multiple subject teaching approach, which requires one teacher teach all the subjects. Over, there are over a dozen subjects in elementary school all day long, six to seven class periods to all the students, making it impossible for teachers to offer in-depth teaching in, on any subject, but especially the core subjects such as language and math to all the students. So uh, what do they do? American teachers, they have to make compromises and they skip important curricular contents and activities, left many holes in their education, left many students behind. And reform measures such as remedial classes and STEM program in high schools or even in college cannot make up for the loss in the lower level schools. And this is the, a, a chart of the distribution of time we made at that time to look at the, how much time uh, American teachers and versus Chinese teachers spend on each major uh, activity, teaching and learning activity. For example, teaching in front of the classroom, American teachers, elementary school teachers, six to seven hours a day on all subject areas. Chinese teachers for language and math, only one or two hours a day on one core subject area. No time to plan for lesson. Chinese teachers every day and every week. Also so-called corrective feedback. You need to give feedback to students, right? American teachers, almost no time. Chinese teachers every day. 
they don't, when they teach one or two hours on one or two subjects, they don't leave the school. They spend the time correcting student work, providing feedback. Chinese teachers also have a lot of time every day, every week for social activities, for recreational activities, for political studies, which is also a social activity, and uh, to, uh, to get together longer, longer time. So teaching, they really is a social activity in China. So I made strong recommendations for change for American schools. And my report, so I suggest what American educators can learn from the Chinese uh, in our article. My co-authors are from Nanjing Normal University. And we recommend that the multiple subject approach in American elementary schools must be replaced with the single subject approach using Chinese elementary schools. Otherwise, they will never be able to catch up in basic skills education with the Chinese and other high performing uh, schools. My, this report was sent to all superintendents, superintendent desks and some school principals. And when they listened to my presentation, they would came up to me said they were so shocked and they want to, they are willing to experiment with the Chinese approach. But again, uh, the, the American schooling practice is a very conservative, very strong resistance to change. So uh, even though my study was uh, in, uh, conducted and publications that made uh, over 15 years ago, I don't think they have made any substantial change. In any case, I, my, I also published my study findings and in major Chinese education journals and Zhongguo教育日报,上海社会科学报,中国社会科学网, etc. To, um, uh, and, and I echo Yang Zhenning's uh, view on American basic education. And so I made a lot of presentations in China as well. Uh, another interesting study I want to share with you is uh, my study of the American or CSUN students in China. Um, and uh, as uh, some of you know, that since 1999, the China Institute of CSUN helped 91, actually, what, if you count the numbers and CSUN students and graduates to apply and obtain full scholarships from the uh, China Scholarship Council to study in top universities in China, including Peking University, Tsinghua, Fudan. All recipients claim that it was a great life-changing experience. So we want to know how life-changing uh, this is. And, and then, so in 2015, uh, when my uh, Dean of Education, Spagna, and I visited China and met with uh, the CSUN students there, we conducted an evaluation and interview study with them to explore the impact of their life and study experiences in China on their personal and professional life, right? Um, the, uh, the data we uh, gathered uh, include also the, uh, these students' personal stories on their impressions and experiences in China and in the China Institute newsletter because we invited them always to write about their impressions and their stories and experiences in China. And this study really has a very strong significance uh, implications and for today. Uh, as the U.S.-China relationship and is uh, going through a special um, period. Uh, because what we found is that the American students who have studied and lived in China went through a fundamental and transformational change in their emotional and cognitive feelings for China. They were able to dismiss the negative stereotypes on China and Chinese people as often portrayed in Western news media that we read every day here, such change is not possible without studying and living in China. And these young students from the United States through the study life and work in China developed real friendship and understanding for China and the Chinese people. Whether staying in China or returning to the United States, they continue to serve as bridges of friendship and help change views on China by the Americans around them. They will develop win-win collaborations and not competitive enemy relationships with the Chinese people. Um, and uh, uh, we also, we made recommendations and for change uh, in the Chinese uh, 
uh, universities and colleges who receive American students and they should improve their orientation services and guidance for American students should also designate responsible mentors and create more culturally responsive teaching and learning for American and international students. And the living, uh, and uh, our students said living with Chinese roommates or homestay in Chinese families can really um, help them to benefit much more. So um, we actually, this is the, our students who are very deeply grateful to the China Scholarship Council for the opportunity and to, for them to afford to study abroad full time. And uh, we uh, actually, we developed a plan to continue the study with the Tsinghua University Center for American Studies. Dean Spack and I organized a special panel for CSUN award recipients at the 2016 Asian Studies on the Pacific Coast Conference. And so they actually presented their experience and to more American students and our report um, uh, part was uh, entitled 美国学生在中国, 留学经历, uh, in China's leading education journals and social science network and etc. Um, with summaries of the most valuable lessons learned by American students in China and recommendations for improving the reception of American students by Chinese university. I was told that our report, this report was sent to all Chinese university presidents' desks. And the Chinese uh, American student also really benefited from this program. And Dale Chang, for example, one of my education students and born here, was not able to communicate in Chinese with his relatives and grandparents before he went to China to study in our project because his parents wanted to totally Americanize him and only speak English even at home. So, but after he studied in China for two years and also taught English there in a university for another four years, he was able to speak Chinese freely. And with his grandparents, he went actually to explore his roots hometown in Henan and felt so happy and proud. He, uh, I encouraged him, he write about this experience and as a chapter for a book. So there are scholarship uh, students too. Another significant study I did is a historical study and critical evaluation of Zhang Dewey's influence on Chinese education. Zhang Dewey, and you perhaps know, uh, was considered the most prominent American educational philosopher in the 20th century and considered by many as the most influential American educator on Chinese education. I would think my mentor, John Goodlad, also had equal significance impact on Chinese education. But John Dewey, because of his historical visit and lectures in China on education democracy for more than two years in 1919 and 1921, all his works were translated into Chinese and his former students, including Hu Shi, Tao Xingzhi, Jiang Mengling, Chen Heqing, uh, all the famous Chinese uh, educators. However, he has also generated much criticism in China in 1950s through 70s and at other times. Uh, his progressive education philosophy uh, has uh, had a sign very significant impact on educational development and reform. Um, and, and it actually it echoes the new education policy proposed by uh, the Chinese uh, educators and educational policy makers. And as now they are placing more emphasis on the development of individuality and creativity. I was fascinated by this topic as a graduate student, but I only found time to explore it during my work years at, at UCLA. And I designed and conducted a historical study and critical evaluation of Zhang Dewey's influence on Chinese education. Also a case study of Tao Xingzhi's experiment of Dewey ideas in Chinese teacher education at Xiaozhuang Shifan. And I published papers in top education journals and the Journal of American Education at University of Chicago and Teachers College Record at Columbia University. And my study also was recognized by the American John Dewey Society as the most exciting Dewey scholarship. 
So uh, these two publications are also reprinted and disseminated by the UCLA Center for Pacific Rim Studies. And, and when I served as on the faculty executive committee of the center at that time in the 1990s, uh, a surprise discovery of my Dewey study was this very precious moving letter that John Dewey wrote to Tao Xingzhi in 1944. And I discovered it in the Nanjing Tao Xingzhi Museum. And that was a motivation for me uh, to want to share the story about the, also the friendship and uh, relationship between Chinese and American educators with the world. And then the letter with my facilitation is now collected in the, um, uh, the most prominent center for Dewey studies in, uh, in the United States. So uh, in 2019, I was invited to then serve as the Dewey lecturer, lecturer, and this means the keynote speaker by the American John Dewey Society um, for the annual meeting in Toronto to commemorate the 100th anniversary of Dewey's visit and lecture in China in 1919. Uh, I was very proud of that because I was the first Asian American scholar to receive this, this distinguished honor. And because they only select one scholar each year. And, uh, and so uh, in this case, I, I was following the footsteps of, of some of the most famous educators in this country and including my own mentor, John Goodlad and Stanford University uh, uh, Dean of uh, Education, uh, Lee Schumann, and Columbia University Teachers College Dean, Lawrence Kramen, and Philip Jackson, and many others. And so the, uh, this uh, was the publicity of my uh, speech at that time. Uh, when I first delivered uh, a presentation on John Dewey and Chinese education in 1994, uh, ARA conference, I was the only Chinese there. No one was there, no, no other Chinese scholars were there. But in, in 2019, when I was given, uh, giving the, uh, the keynote speech, many Chinese scholars were present uh, at the uh, John Dewey Society annual meeting. Um, and uh, my keynote speech was also published uh, in a special series um, in Beijing International Review of Education that year and 2019, and will be the first chapter for a major collection of essays on Dewey and Chinese education that will be published by the European-based the Brio publishers uh, this year. I also published the two papers in Chinese uh, on my Dewey and Chinese education studies in major journals and, and, and uh, Chinese uh, social science network, and will also be included as a chapter in a major book in Chinese on John Dewey and Chinese education. My most recent comparative education study is this American education under COVID-19. So this was uh, designed and conducted last year, uh, last spring uh, when COVID first broke out in the spring. And uh, um, I was invited by East China Normal University scholars to uh, work uh, to, uh, to share information about uh, education, basic education in the United States. And I used the LAUSD as a case study. And then uh, some of our faculty here and their children actually participated in this study. And I had uh, looked at different aspects and actually one of the most shocking <laughs> discoveries that the first important thing actually for the LAUSD was not teaching or learning, but to feed the children. As 80, over 80% 80 of the students in LAUSD, which is the second largest school district in the United States, but over 80% of the students are from family of under poverty line. So they all need to receive free lunch, free food. So the first priority for the school district was not teaching and learning, but how to distribute free lunch to all the students every day, two meals, not only the students, but also their parents and some other members in the society who, who need the support with food. And so I, and then I also looked at not only I look at the digital divide, I look at how students from uh, minority uh, families and over 80, 70% of the students in uh, LAUSD are from minority 
background, and then the digital divide and how uh, have placed them in a dis uh, in, in a disadvantaged situation. And then, so not only academic learning, but also their social and emotional well-being. So I published the paper in the Journal for School Studies and, and made presentations online at several international education conferences. For my work in comparative education, I was recognized by a cover page interview uh, in a major Chinese journal and which was also included in a major book on the China education dream. And I feel extremely honored for such recognition. In order to uh, encourage young students and scholars to engage in comparative education work, uh, I, a few years ago, I donated $25,000 to establish an endowed more good led comparative education scholarship for CSUN education students to remember my Chinese mother, Mo Yuexin, and my American mother, Lin Goodlad. And here you see the two photos. My visiting scholars followed my example and also donated a total of more than $35,000 to create a comparative education fund at CSUN. And the first scholarship 2017 was given to uh, one of my graduate students here, Wang Zili from Yunnan province, and, and she received her master's degree. She also participated actively in my uh, rural school principal study and gathered impressive data from Shenri La area in Yunnan. The second uh, comparative education scholarship recipient was also a graduate student in special education and uh, educational leadership uh, who is dedicated to introducing useful lessons from Chinese and Japanese education to American schools. And this is the third scholarship recipient is from an, uh, a graduate student in, in multicultural education at CSUN. Uh, she's also very committed to putting her learning into practice and giving back to the community. Um, uh, here uh, in the end, I want to share with you, and this is uh, one of my unrealized plan. And uh, we, uh, my former college dean and I, we worked, we tried to create an endowed professorship and center on US China comparative education at CSUN, but uh, we, uh, we were not able to raise the fund, and we need $2 million for this. And, Maybe one day, one of our uh, younger scholars here um, uh, uh, in comparative education at CSUN uh, can realize this dream. And so, so right now, this will remain a beautiful dream for now. This is the time when I miss, I said, maybe I should have stayed at UCLA at that time because UCLA has more powerful alumni who would have donated maybe uh, uh, funding support to create such a center. But on the other hand, I don't regret because I have been able to really uh, develop a very meaningful and highly interesting career in comparative education here. Uh, some of the unfinished projects and plans, and I have uh, developed two complete proposal joint projects with the Tsinghua University Center for American Studies, both focus on teacher education uh, and, and, and U.S. Uh, CSUN Chinese student collaboration to improve schools and especially for rural areas. And we, uh, I still hope that uh, some scholars will carry that forward. I would like to write a book or report on the best school principle and reform practice in the United States. And, and my, uh, uh, the role model I have here is Dr. Yvonne Chen. Um, and uh, I, I would like to organize a collection of my comparative education essays um, and uh, for future students and younger faculty. Um, I can continue and complete a follow-up study that I started on the Chinese leaders, and these are former CSUN scholars and in the leadership training programs that I designed uh, for uh, Chinese young leaders. And I already actually gathered data, but I just have not had the time to complete it because of the all these other projects going on. And I also, I have gathered data on a comparative study of teaching and learning in American and Chinese universities. And based on my survey and interview with uh, former uh, Chinese visiting scholars, and again, 
I have presented on this and but have not uh, had time to finish writing and publishing the report. I would also like to facilitate and editing and translating more classic works in education. Uh, and so I can, we can share best lessons in education for both sides. And, and of course, and I would like to uh, collect and, and uh, write a memoir of the CSUN China Institute and our Center for Partnerships for Educational Reform in the 30 years that I worked here. And of course, I would like to uh, have more time for healthy living and daily exercises, cooking, gardening, reading, traveling, all these fun things. And, and also, this is important. Uh, I want to learn to play the piano with my daughter, who is an award-winning pianist for enjoyment, for challenge to the brain, and for coordination of, of body movements. I want to share just very quickly with you a short piece that I played. <laughs> Okay, and, and then looking at the future of education, uh, and I actually I borrow these slides from one of the webinars I attended this week. There are still so many interesting aspects to explore. So hopefully, uh, I, I'm hoping that more young people will choose education as a profession and develop comparative education as a career. And thank you all very much for your attendance and attention. Stay safe and sound. These are some of my favorite sites uh, at the university here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Sue. It's a really wonderful talk for all of us and uh, really enjoyed uh, your music you played at the end of the slide. Yeah, I don't know. You have just learned a new skill. <laughs> yeah, Jenny is such a great pianist. Um, we we miss her playing. Hopefully, yeah, someday. Um, we do have some questions um, from the chat and from the Q&A. You want to handle uh, the questions or you want me to read the question for you? You can, the chat has a few questions yeah. for Q&A. So yeah, Dr. Sun, why don't you yeah, select uh, uh, what you think are the, the, uh, the uh, most okay. important yeah, questions and so we can chat. Let me see. Um, I think um, Jun Li, um, maybe if you are still here, I think I can ask you to, to speak. Li uh, Jun Jiao Shou ma? Jun Jiao Shou, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hai Li Jun Jiao Shou, I know it's from Canada, yeah. And also, um, Zhou Min Jiao Shou. Yeah. So I, I had, she, yeah, she wrote a long commentary. Yeah. Right. Oh. I want well, her. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Su Lao Shi. 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 太让我感动了
都有很多的内容的新的学习，包括今天，所以我的心情是很激动的。这个我主要是向您表示感谢。<笑>那么问题呢，倒是其次。我我相信呢，这个呃，来日方长，我们还会有很多很多很多的机会啊、呃，一起共同讨论这个比较教育呃和国际教育啊、呃，尤其是中美呃这个教育的这个相互交流啊、呃、谢谢您。谢谢谢谢你啊，李教授。哎，我想告诉大家呢，呃，李军教授呢是我们的 incoming president， the first Chinese uh uh American president for the American Comparative and International Education Association. And we have known each other for like twenty years. Uh, Jun Li. Uh, when we both attended the Oxford Education Forum in London. More than that, Doctor Su. More than more than twenty years. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um. Yeah, so I I I'm hoping that we can recruit Dr. Li Jin here, ah,、uh, either to CSUN or to UCLA, and we really we need scholars like you and with your experience and 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 your accomplishments and to continue to carry on ah、uh, comparative education work here. So、Thank、Dr. Li is right now in Canada. Yeah. Thank you, Su 老师 That will be a great personal honor. <laughs> we Thank you, Professor Lee, as well.、Mm -hmm. um, um, Professor Min Zhou,、um, do you want to talk a little bit about your your your, your question in the chat? Ah,、uh, uh, sure, sure.、Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Justin, I have Thank already. Thank you, Min. <laughs> I have already written、uh, into the chat. I just、okay. read it out. Um, and、uh, and I have a few questions too.、Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was a very inspiring talk. I also learned so much about yourself. Even though we are friends, but there are a lot of things that I、uh, don't know,、uh, and now I know.、Uh, and also about your work, especially U.S.-China comparative education. So thank you so much. Um, it also turned out that we had a lot of、uh, things in common.、Uh -huh. Like we both、yeah. grew up during the Chinese Revolution, Chinese Cultural Revolution. We both hail from China, attended U.S. graduate school in 1984, and got our got our PhD in 1989,、mm -hmm. um, and had more than 40 years. Working in the educational arena, like in China, I was a high school teacher. Before, you know, before I went to college. So, congratulations on your highly accomplished career, and、Thank、I'm you, so、me. proud of you.、Uh, so, here are a few questions, but you don't have to answer it all. Three、mm -hmm. questions that are related. First, can you shed some light on how your own upbringing in China? And your professional experiences in China and the U.S.,、um, how that have informed your research. And second question: What were some of the most severe difficulties or most daunting challenges you encountered as you tried to develop your career in U.S. higher education? And、um, uh, how did you have them out? To achieve success, and the third one is um, is uh, uh, do you consider yourself successful, and in what way? Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Ming. Thank you, Ming Yao. I really you can I, select. You can I, select. Okay. The address. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All all of them are excellent questions, and that actually I've been thinking about some of those. Uh, I think your to answer your、uh, first question. I mean, I hope that you will host, organize, and and initiate uh, uh, a research study on scholars like us. Yeah, I I, I feel among the existing Chinese American literary research literature, and this is there is a void. I think we have a lot on the history and past and. Chinese American in general, but I think on the academics and 
uh, especially scholars and 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 uh, like us, and and then uh, there is still uh, a void. I remember one of your graduate students and came to interview me about my uh, academic experience and in this country. But first of all, to answer your first question, how my prior experiences in China. Uh, influenced my uh, current work. Uh, I think two things stood out that was really important in my background experience. One was the um, working on the rice farm. I think that really was uh, the best character education I had and really helped me to understand the, the, the basic necessities and difficulties. And I think uh, really cultivated uh, my uh, spirit and character and to, uh, to be able to take up any challenge in the future. So that was a very significant, I consider, life lesson I learned, even though it was really hardship. The second very important experience and, and also I think a major factor for my success as a comparative educa education uh, researcher is, uh, was my working experiences and for three years in the Chinese National Ministry of Education. Even though I was, uh, you know, it's like uh, when I remember you wrote about being an accidental sociologist and I, I, I was like an accidental educator. I, it was, I didn't choose to become an educator. I was assigned the job. But after I got into the education work and I developed a real interest in education, and then the, my position there really enabled me to have a good understanding and overview of education in China, but also really developed my skills uh, in administration work and, and in uh, developing collaboration and exchange with educators from other countries and specifically from North American uh, universities. And I think that that laid the foundation for my success in developing a good relationship with my mentors and with my co-workers and with other educators and, and paved the, I think, uh, 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 the way uh, for my um, development of uh, all these uh, interesting comparative education research project. Now, I want to emphasize, I think, most of the comparative education research project would be considered, for example, by the job administrators in American universities for faculty like me as unnecessary because I fulfilled their requirements for the job of the full professor already with dozens of publications on American education. But none of our, our job specification here require us to do comparative education. But we do it, I think I did it because of my background in China, because we are, you know, we have these Chinese roots and I have such strong feelings and passion for improving education, not only in American schools and universities, but also in China. And then my, the, even the, just the two years I'm working on the rice farm and uh, helped me to, to develop this really strong feeling for, uh, for the conditions, for the poor conditions of education and life of uh, the rural people in China. So I'm glad that in the end, I was able to extend my comparative study to rural schools to include rural school principles and education. And then because I really want to help improve education there. I always said uh, when an American uh, scholar is participating in a China related project, they are considered making a contribution. But I said for me and for scholars like us who came from China, I feel it's our obligation. It's not a contribution, it's an obligation that when we, after we, if, of course, we need to establish ourselves in the American academic, but once we establish ourselves, we are in a good position to make contributions and not only to American education and society, but also 
to the Chinese and, and to help uh, not only that, because we are professors, we are mentors, we can mentor young people. That's why I'm very also focused on creating opportunities for young students to study in China and then to come back to serve as bridges because uh, we cannot just rely on people like ourselves and we need to rely on the younger generation to carry on the good work uh, that uh, we feel so passionate about. Uh, I think that's, a, what's the third question mean? Uh, oh yeah, what are some of the, the difficult uh, difficulties I encountered? Yes, there are always challenges and difficulties and sometimes even petty jealousy uh, from other faculty that can hinder uh, your, uh, your progress. And I remember uh, after creating a, a proposal for a really million dollar project of uh, training of a graduate program for training private higher education administrators for Shanghai. And then some of my colleagues for no apparent good reason, but petty jealousy went strongly against it. So in the end, we were not able to, uh, I, I received the grant already from Shanghai for that project, million dollar, and it will bring a lot of benefits to the university um, and not to mention the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, international uh, relations and, and the meaning, the good meaning of the project, but even financially, it will really benefit the university. But some other faculty just purely out of petty jealousy went against the project. So in the end, we had to give up on that project. I, I had to recommend that project to another university who can do it. And they felt it's like a pie dropped from the sky. So those were the moments that I felt frustrating. And I think most of the fa administrators and faculty I have met in my work are very supportive uh, of international collaboration and believe very strongly in uh, cultivating friendship and, and understanding. But there are also, uh, as we know, conservative and, and uh, 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 administrators and and scholars and who do not, uh, who really go against and they will set up obstacles for our work. So that's difficult. But what I found is that no matter how difficult sometimes it is, there are always projects, always possibilities that you can work on something like if a, a door is closed that you can open another window. So there are always opportunities uh, that there are always good people to work together. I hope did I answer all the questions, me? Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, also I want to thank um, Professor Zhou um, for her questions. And I will uh, like to announce that we will invite um, Professor Zhou to come to see some next semester to give us a talk. We actually wanted to have her for a long time, but finally we can make it maybe um, in person uh, for the next semester. It, it depends certainly on the pandemic situation, but at least we'll, we'll have a lecture either in person or virtually. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sun. Thank we you, Dr. Su. Yeah, it was we, a great we lecture. Forward. Thank you. Thank you. And I look forward to visiting season too. Yeah, we have a beautiful campus, as you can see from my pictures here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, I think it's about time. I, unless you have some really important questions. And uh, I think I want to thank um, Dr. Justin Su for such a wonderful talk and with a lot of uh, not only personal reflections, but also um, sharing her experiences with um, many of us, especially the young faculties, on um, how she has accomplished so much. Uh, in her life, um, not just for CSUN's education or American education, but also for the international collaborations. And I would say, I think um, Dr. Joe has the last question, whether um, Justine considered her life successful here. I would personally say Dr. Justine Su had a really successful career and life. Um, so that's my personal <laughs> opinion. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you, Wimi. Yeah, I think the our younger faculty are really they have they are doing formidable work and remarkable in their qualifications, and I'm sure that uh, they will accomplish much more. And and I'm looking forward to uh, restoration of the U.S. China education uh, relationships, and so that. Uh, all of us and will be able to uh, make more contributions and to uh, further uh, our mission, the mission of the China Institute, and that is to promote friendship, um, uh, uh, ex exchange, collaboration, and understanding. And uh, I think together we can do it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks for all the participants and thanks for all the people who have come today. It's a really wonderful day, beautiful day. It's really hard actually, <laughs> but uh, we want to thank Dr. Justin Su again for the wonderful talk. And I will send you the link uh, about the video um, once it's available. <clears throat> uh, I, yeah, we mean, I see here there is a question that what is the big difference between education leadership? Oh, and okay. Yeah, please go ahead to answer to that. I didn't see that. Uh, the, uh, the, we are, the College of Education has several departments. Educational leadership is one of them. So at the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies, uh, focus on training uh, school, uh, school and higher education administrators. So uh, in the United States, if people want to become administrators and promoted to from the teacher's position, they need to come to the university to get a administrator credential and then to get a graduate degree in educational leadership. So that's our, our department major mission. And other departments we have, for example, elementary education department, uh, their primary mission is to train teachers to, be, to work in elementary school. And we have secondary education department training teachers to become a uh, secondary school teacher. Then we have the special education department. And so you can get a credential in special education, become a special education resource teacher in schools, which is very important in American schools. We also have a deaf education, deaf studies uh, education department, uh, and also a department for educational psychology and counseling. So you need to, if you want to become a school psychologist or counselor, you also need to get credentials. You can go on our uh, website to get more information. Thank you. I think um, that's it for the day. And we'll, uh, if you'd like to receive newsletter uh, updates um, from the CSUN Chinese Institute, let me know. Um, but um, again, let's thank Justin Su for such a wonderful talk. And we look forward to her talk in next semester. Thank you very much, Dr. Sen, uh, for organizing this event and for giving me this opportunity and really to reflect on uh, this, uh, my uh, very, uh, interesting and meaningful career. Uh, I'm really glad and even though it was not my childhood expectation and choice, but it really ended up uh, as uh, uh, I think one of the most uh, uh, interesting and meaningful uh, career uh, for I think for anybody. So I do, I want to encourage more young people uh, to get into education as a profession and to work on uh, develop more comparative education research project that can benefit both Chinese and American education.